So we tried to dialogue with them for a couple of years and they never responded. And that's when we started doing our negative advertising campaign on Frank Perdue. In many ways, Perdue was an even more ideal target than Revlon because he was just such a, a bad news personality. It was bad news for the chickens, it was bad news for the environment. He was bad news as far as worker safety was concerned. There was a lot of sexual harassment in this plant. He exploited the hell out of minority women. And every which way you looked at Frank Perdue was just nothing but bad news. My Purdue chickens turn out golden yellow because I give them an expensive diet. I remember one day at lunchtime an enormous demonstration on the Fifth Avenue side of the General Motors building. And there was hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people who Henry introduced to us who carried big signs and who were picketing our company. And what really showed me just how effective Henry Spira is and was, is that in the middle of that was every major science writer, science reporter, newspaper man, TV science person. And that evening on the news and the next morning's newspapers, we took a beating up the likes of which no opponent of Cassius Clay or Muhammad Ali ever took. But more importantly, I knew the company had a very significant problem that could cut not just to one day stock price trading, but could cut to the core of the company. And in fact, if it weren't really well handled and so forth, it would have such a deleterious effect that it could theoretically wipe Revlon off the, uh, off the face of the uh, counter in drugstores and department stores. Most people believe that rabbits are voiceless. Whoa! The demonstration featured a piece of street theater, and protesters dressed up in rabbit costumes brought along some live bunnies to help make their point. They want Revlon to stop using rabbits to test its products for eye irritancy. Henry Spira, a high school English teacher, organized the protest. He says he's pointing the finger at Revlon because they are the leaders in the industry. For we're trying to tell Revlon that the people are not going to stand still for the blinding of rabbits for the sake of another mascara, for the sake of another shampoo. And we're telling them with a sense of urgency, we want them to start developing immediately other non-animal methods for testing. Revlon, stop! Stop! Torturing animals! In any business, when you're dealing with people who have uh, values or an agenda that's different from yours, it starts to feel like blackmail. They want to know if we reach some kind of agreement, is this the end of it, or is this just the first step and is there going to be more and more and more? If so, uh, what are we letting ourselves in for? So an important element of this campaign from Revlon's point of view is, is there something we can do that will put us on a common footing that will make the problem go away or contain it or at least put it on some course where everybody knows what's going to happen and we can plan for it? And that was one of the great uncertainties here because this had never been achieved between any piece of the animal rights movement and any company that they had spoken with. Ultimately, what Revlon did was they pushed $750,000 into Rockefeller University for Rockefeller to develop alternatives to the Dre's rabbit eye test. And what that did, in effect, was for the first time legitimize and institutionalize the search for alternatives. Not only was that a hugely singular triumph for Henry Spira, but more importantly, it opened up an entire era of cooperation between the so-called business community and the animal rights group. It was interesting is when I started doing some work at the Columbia Business School, I dealt with this professor who asked me, you know, what was my background and why was I interested in what I was doing there. And uh, he said, well, one of my best and most popular cases is the Revlon case with Henry Spira. Because, I mean, that is now a classic negotiating technique that will be taught at that school forever, I hope.
After Revlon came across with $750,000 for alternatives, uh, we sent a letter off to uh, Avon and said that they were the other flagship in the industry and that they could do no less than Revlon did. And being that they were aware of the ads that we had done on Revlon, they were real quick in responding and they pushed $750,000 towards alternatives, some of which money went to Johns Hopkins to set up the Center for Alternatives. Good morning, Center for Alternatives to Animal Testing. The center was formed 15 years ago to develop in vitro and other alternative methods to help the risk assessor, the federal and other regulatory agencies, to use non-animal methods in the risk assessment process. We are trying to protect human health. We're trying to improve that which we can for animal welfare. But we understand the necessity to use animals to continue to develop the biological base that will allow us to eliminate their use eventually. That first meeting was uh, a little painful because Henry decided he was going to tell me how to run the center. And as Henry found out during that meeting that I had very strong opinions of how that center was going to run, that science was going to be the driving force, and it was not going to be a show in PR, but it was going to be a very active activity, but based on basic scientific principles. At this point in time, I've learned to have Henry work with me and think through some of the issues, to try to look at where are the next stages in development, what are the issues that are important, how do we marshal the resources that are necessary. And Henry has been a, uh, a very insightful thinker and strategic planner. Yeah, Peter, I thought this might interest you. These are our shares of stock. This is our portfolio. This is how we gain access to the movers and shakers in major corporations. One share of stock makes it possible for us to attend and speak at, use a mic, meet the chief executive officer at the annual shareholders meeting. Right. So you can, you just have to buy one share and you can ask questions. And you can, you can oh, attend yeah. and you can ask questions. Right. And you know damn well that the chief executive officer knows about your concern. Procter and Gamble. Ah, so that's what got you into the meeting where you got me into the meeting of yeah. the of one of the major household companies in the world. Well, another industry that was projecting an image and you know, that had to be conscious of its image and of its reputation is a whole household industry, and the biggest one there is Procter and Gamble. So we contacted Procter and Gamble, and being that they had, it's it's like an enormous corporation that rather than getting them to push money out, outside, that they use their own internal experience and resources to develop alternatives and to publicize those alternatives that they've developed. And that's what we tried to get them to do. And when they were non-responsive, I went to a shareholders meeting. And everybody up there is all dressed up. And I came there, a pair of open sneakers and a t-shirt and a pair of khakis. And, you know, basically I asked the questions that I had asked in my letters about that you're leading household products companies and you've got an obligation to promote alternatives and what are you doing? And the chair hadn't really been prepared for this question and basically I spent like a lot of time preparing and prepping the CEO for questions that might be raised at the stockholders meeting and he didn't know where he was coming or he was going. And I was pulling out documents from my back pocket and that the wind up was that he set up a meeting with decision makers for us to be able to discuss the issue later on. Robert. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. And uh, they're going to be actually demonstrating some of the cell culture methods that we use for eye irritation testing. So do you want to get started? Sure. Okay. The first method we're going to show you is something called the neutral red uptake assay. And this is an assay around... Henry is not out for a show. He's not trying to get the attention on himself. He really wants to see change. And he's very reasonable. I think one reason he's effective is that he's reasonable, he doesn't expect people to change overnight, and he rewards small steps, whereas some animal rights groups think it should be all or nothing. You know, looking back, all the successes that happened in the live animal scene amount to a mere drop in a bucket 
when compared with the 7 billion farm animals that suffer from birth to slaughter. Over the last few decades, the traditional farm has virtually disappeared. The animals that used to be out in the fields eating grass, the hens that used to be scratching in the farmyard, they've gone inside. These days you've got factory farms, you've got tens of thousands of chicks in one big dark hangar, and basically they just step over their own uh, ammonia and their own feces, and they never have a good day, they don't see the sunlight, they can't stretch their wings, they can't do any one of their natural instincts, that they're all thwarted. And you've got calves and crates where they can't turn around. You've got gestation crates for hogs where, they, where basically they're imprisoned in iron frames throughout their entire lives. And the other thing, obviously, is that if animals live this kind of a sickly existence, that the meat is not going to be healthy either. The animal movement has not really done enough to tell people about this, to, to let people know that the neatly packaged pieces of meat or, or eggs that come out of the supermarket have come from animals who are leading basically miserable lives throughout their entire lives. Yeah, the first campaign was uh, focused on uh, Frank Perdue, who's basically the chicken mogul of the eastern seaboard of the United States. You know, ideally we thought that he would play the same role as Revlon did, that we would contact him and that he would set up a center for farm animal well-being at the University of Maryland, which he was associated with in any case. Uh, so we tried to dialogue with him for a couple of years, and they never responded. And that's when we started doing our negative advertising campaign on Frank Perdue. In many ways, Perdue was an even more ideal target than Revlon, because he was just such a, a, a bad news personality. Yeah, Frank Perdue was just bad news all the way around. It was bad news for the chickens. It was bad news for the environment. He was bad news as far as worker safety was concerned. There was a lot of sexual harassment in this plant. He exploited the hell out of minority women. And every which way you looked at Frank Perdue was just nothing but bad news. My Perdue chickens turn out gold and yellow because I give them an expensive diet that includes these wholesome yellow foods. He was a poultry mogul who looked and talked like his product and an advertising agency, one of the best in the United States at that time, had seized on that and made him the stand-up persona for his product. And what he did for a lot of years was to talk about the pampered life that these animals lived before they arrived on your dinner table. A chicken is what it eats, and my chickens eat better than people do. Well, we figured that the best strategy to use in connection with Purdue was the strategy of self-interest of the consumer, that there was a danger in the chickens from the point of view of Salmonella and E. coli, and we figured that the symbol for protecting people for safety's sake was a condom. Well, we're looking for a, a condom in which you can place a Frank Purdue chicken, so we went to some of the places in Greenwich Village and asked them for the biggest condom that they had, and people look at you sort of on the odd side. Uh, and we said, well, we needed to put a chicken inside, and they looked at you even odder. In fact, we were able to get something that could accommodate a fairly large Purdue bird and bring it back to the studio, and after a while, after breaking a, a lot of condoms, we finally got the picture we needed. Well, after we did our full-page ads in the New York Times, there was a lot of media response, not so much to the chickens as to the issue of worker safety. A number of programs appeared in connection with that. And what the campaign did for us is that it created a calling card for us in the sense that when we approached other companies like McDonald's or like the uh, shackling and hoisting outfits, that they could see that the options are either to dialogue with us or to have a campaign like the Purdue campaign mounted on them. The uh, face branding campaign points out the importance of keeping one's antennas up. There was a minor item in the Federal Register that said that the U.S. Department of Agriculture was going to expand their program of face branding cattle being imported from Mexico. And we felt that this was a good opportunity to revisit the whole issue and challenge it because it's kind of easy to make the public identify with having a hot iron brand being pushed on one's jaw. This is crude and it's way above and beyond what the public would accept. 
Well, the reason they were doing the face branding, it was a uh, way to mark cattle uh, for disease regulatory purposes. And, you know, there's other places you can brand cattle besides on the face. I mean, you can do it back on the rear end. We attempted to have a dialogue with the people at the U.S. Department of Agriculture. They set up a meeting. They canceled the meeting. At which point we figured that with 30,000 animals getting their faces scorched each day, uh, this lackadaisical attitude isn't appropriate. So we got two people to go down to Mexico to actually get these photographs of, of face branding in progress so the public could see and feel the terror on the faces of these animals as the hot iron poker is being pushed into their jaw. We were able, in fact, to get sequence photography. It shows an animal with the iron initially on the face and then how the cloud of smoke grows as its face almost bursts into flame. And using that, we was able to put together an ad which headlines, this is what USDA policy looks like. Can you imagine what it feels like? There were a thousand people contacted the Secretary of Agriculture the first day after the ads appeared. And later on, 12,000 people wrote to the U.S. Department of Agriculture commenting on it. And when the U.S. Department of Agriculture saw the public response, they became enormously responsive. And not only did they stop the expansion, but they also stopped the entire program of face branding. The importance of Henry's campaign about face branding is that he turned around the entire United States Department of Agriculture. That's a bit like turning a super tanker. It's a huge entity, and to get it to admit that it was wrong in what it was doing, and in the process to acknowledge that it had to take on board animal welfare as a factor in its policies, was really an enormous victory. Uh, one of the practices that has most outraged animal protectionists has been the shackling and hoisting of conscious animals. Basically, you wrap a chain around one leg of a cow or cattle and hoist them up in the air while they're still alive and they're thrashing, and then you slit their throat. And uh, the Temple of Grandin had developed an alternative, what they call a double restrainer system, where the animal will still be conscious but not be turned upside down, hanging. And we suggest to these companies that there's no viable alternative and that they move towards a viable alternative. Well, an animal weighs 1,200 pounds, and if you weighed 1,200 pounds, I don't think a chain around your ankle lifting you up in the air by one leg would feel very good. These cattle uh, bellow uh, tremendously when you do this and, you know, show obvious signs of pain and suffering when they're hung upside down. And the heavier the animal is, the worse it is. And shackling and hoisting is not part of the actual, you know, ritual slaughter. Shackling and hoisting is something that a plant does because they just don't want to spend the money to put in a proper uh, upright uh, restraining chute. And there'd been a lot of campaigns and they went nowhere. And one, uh, one possible reason why they went nowhere is because these slaughterhouses are really not concerned about the image that they project. Uh, so what we did is that we went to some of their corporate customers and used that as leverage on the slaughterhouses. And I think there was no doubt in the minds of those people that were involved that they could become the next Frank Perdue in the press and, and all the spin-off journalism. The first one that we contacted was Morrell because the, the chief executive officer had a good track record on worker safety and we figured if he was responsive to that he might be responsive to this as well and kind of worked out real well and they just went right into an upright restrainer system where the animal doesn't get turned upside down before ritual slaughter. But then the others started giving us a hard time and we did go to their corporate uh, customers and uh, pressurize them and they realized that uh, this is something that they did not want the public to get involved in and we just knocked them off one after the other. Early this year, I uh, found out that I had esophageal cancer and I had a major operation. And then when I got out of the operation, I basically just resumed my work as I had before. I figured there's no point in worrying about cancer. I'll do whatever it's going to do, and I've got work to do. And the work's been proceeding. We were looking not so much just to raise awareness, but to make a difference, to make something happen that's going to have an impact. 
We've always been sensitive to the fact that uh, there are other issues besides animal welfare issues. In some of our ads, uh, we focused on sexual harassment, we focused on worker safety, we focused on protecting the environment, we focused on feeding the billions. But it occurred to us that joining forces with these other concerns could have a bigger impact than each one of us working independently. And we approached the folks at uh, Johns Hopkins University School of Public Health and had discussions with them about the possibility of having a center for a sustainable future. We're attempting to bring together information from population, nutrition, environment, a variety of scientific disciplines to figure out how we can frame the big questions so that we can then influence policymakers and our entry point is this connection between factory farming and its effects on animals and the environment, human nutrition and its effect on human health, and the changes in human nutrition that we see going on around the world that are just not sustainable. Well, I think one way of looking at it is what uh, the saying of the Native Americans, that what they're concerned about is the impact of what's happening, not for the current generation or the next generation, but the seventh generation from now. Last year, the American Association for the Advancement of Science had a group of experts discussing where we're going into the future, and they just said that with the population explosion and the dwindling water reserves and what the current methods of agriculture are doing to the land, that we wouldn't be able to sustain current methods of animal protein consumption into the next century. And the point is that these experts themselves realize that intensive confinement animal agriculture meshed with a population explosion, meshed with the fact that these emerging consumer countries are now moving from a grain and vegetable-based diet to an animal protein diet, that the planet can't sustain it. So there's got to be change. And all that we're saying is but let's do it earlier rather than later. Despite Henry's poor health, he has been a wonderful friend in the short time I've known him, very supportive of the work of the center, and a, an urgency about the pace at which we're doing things that may in fact uh, come from the fact that he knows he has uh, cancer and that he may not be with us much longer. You know, I guess basically one wants to feel that one's life is amounted to more than consuming products and generating garbage. And I think one would like to be able to look back and say that, hey, one's done the best one can to make this a better place for others. And one can look at it from the point of view of what greater motivation can there be in, in a person's life than do everything one possibly can to reduce pain and suffering. I think the key, the key ingredient of a successful activist is that an activist goes beyond words into results, that they're results oriented, that you stay, that you stay in touch with reality, uh, that, that you take on an issue that's significant, that's gonna make a difference, that hopefully is gonna have ripple effects, and that there's a bottom line, that, it's, that you set out to achieve something and you achieve it, and you put closure on it. The whole forward thrust of the movement Henry's created uh, rests on his shoulders, and if Henry disappears tomorrow, uh, there's an interesting question as to how much of it will survive, uh, how much will be nipped in the bud, how much would be lost by there not being some mechanism in place for someone else to pick up that mantle. In the time that I've talked to Henry, he had never really come to grips with the issue of uh, who was going to carry on in his footsteps and continue fighting the fight the way he fought it. Henry has shown us that one person can make a difference, that you don't need a huge amount of resources or a big organisation behind you, but that if you think carefully and strategically enough, you can get large corporations or government departments to really change their behaviour in a progressive direction. As a child in the 1930s, I spent a couple of years in Germany and I could see things brewing up. 
Uh, later on, reflecting on the Holocaust, it occurred to me that a great many people were saying the right things, having the right thoughts, making the right noises, and doing absolutely nothing about it, similar to our currently politically correct do-nothings. And I think it made a big impact on me that one needs to focus on the bottom line. It's not enough to shout and to yell. One needs to affect change. And one needs to do it in the most effective way possible. And that one needs to make an impact on the whole situation, not just holler and shout and scream and cry. Uh, you know, we should be uh, give you a call. 